message this morning on when God speaks, listen. Listen. It'd be a good idea, I'm telling you. In Genesis 1, 1, you don't have to go there, but it does say in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's what it says. Uh, if you can't get further than that with anybody, you might as well forget even wasting your time with them. I mean, they got to at least believe that, right? Um, but as I noticed, uh, as you follow the trend of God's creation, you'll notice the word said, right? I believe it's a verb. I believe it's an action word, right? Is that what it is? Am I correct? I always look at, you know, I won't tell you who, but. Hey Amen. It seems to be right most of the time, or he just runs a good game. And uh, so you see this verb, and, uh, and <laughs> thoughts that go through this kid. So God uses this word, and whenever he uses something, you need to understand something happens. It's not like us when we talk, we talk, we talk. We say a lot of things, right? But see, when God talks, there's no vanity found. There's no emptiness. Like, it's not like he's got to figure out what to say. It's like when he says something, something happens. It's always purposeful. And uh, we need to understand that because that's something... We, a lot of times, we just compare ourselves with ourselves, and we bring God into the mix, and we're, we're thinking somehow that he has all these leeways, and, well, he don't really understand this, and maybe he's thinking about this. No, no, no. Your mind has to get back to where it belongs. God is God. You be you. You be not God. Okay? And we're not talking about, uh, you know, when they change Toys R Us sign, right? They bought the name You Be Toys. I'm not talking about vernacular where, uh, uh, you know, e ebonics or anything else comes into play. Uh, we're, we're talking about God is God, and there's none other. And if he says something, it means something, period. Whether you and I figure it out or not, it means something. And uh, you, need to, you need to understand that. And every time that in Genesis there, when he said, uh, uh, let there be light or any of these other things, there was. And it was always good. So when God speaks, it's very important to listen. Never forget that. Uh, the world hangs on nothing, but faith cannot hang upon itself. It must hang on Christ. Always remember that. Go to Isaiah 46, 9. Isaiah 46, 9, read 9 uh, through 11, it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. What does that mean? You don't know what that means? It's just plain. What does it mean to Hebrew? No, no. What does it mean to you now? <laughs> Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient times, the things that are not yet, what? Done. Saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a, a, a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Who said that? God said that. What can he do? He can feed you with a raven. He can, he can make a jackass talk. What can God do? Anything God wants to do. I'm just trying to paint a picture here today that you understand that when God says something, you better listen. I better listen. Go to Hebrews 1, 2. Hebrews chapter 1. Probably lost some of you with the Ebonics thing. I always do that, don't I? If I would just trim that. Chapter 1, look what it says in verse 2. 
It says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made what? The worlds. The worlds. Verse 1 tells you the progression. Remember that? God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake at time past unto the fathers by who? The prophets. So here, who's here now? Jesus is here. That's, who, that's who's doing the speaking, right? Did he speak through the prophets? Yes. Why? Because God's, I'm telling you, anything God says means something. Amen. And that's why in verse 2 it says, by whom also he made the worlds. Duh. So it goes back to verse 1. God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past. Jesus is God. Do you get that picture? Okay, then, then in John chapter 7, this is just all introductory material. John chapter 7. You know what affected the kids at camp? God's Word. They'll say, well, it was the illustration the preacher used. But this no, no, you see, there's a combination of things that work together. But the preaching of God's Word, that Word does something to you. And the sooner we all remember that, the better off we are. We, uh, this is the first time this ever happened, but I had three three times this month to be able to speak in jails and prisons. And man, I enjoy it. I mean, I really do. I enjoy it. Because those guys in there, you, if you put on a front in front of them, they will know that. Okay? You can't come in there all pious. Or, I mean, the, the guys read you like a book. they got street knowledge. They've been around a bunch of hustling and, you know, and they're con men from way back. Anyway, so when you go in there, if you just be yourself, they appreciate that right up front. You don't have to be the smartest egg or anything like that, but if you're yourself, they like that. They can, they, they just like that. And I, I, so far, in prisons and jails, I've never had anybody raise their hand and say, I'm not a sinner. Now, they may have believed that in their heart if they were crazy, but nobody's ever said that, and I always offer that, because I'm not going to just say, pray this prayer, and that's it. I want to make sure everybody knows they're a sinner. And if they know they're a sinner, then we can progress from there. And I show them after the Word of God. And uh, at uh, Monday, we had eight saved. And I mean, this was not, how do you know they're saved? Oh, good night. All I know is, if, if, if I tell them people they're sinners, and they agree, when I was lost, I was found. Right? When I was once blind, now I see. Well, the whole song says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a what? Wretch. If they all know they're wretches, and I give them the gospel, and they agree with God on that, and they ask God to come in and save them, that's God's business. I'm not going to worry about that. But anyway, eight of them then. And then we went over to the county over here in, in uh, uh, Oakland County. Brother Evans went somewhere, so me and Gary Campbell was there. And, uh, and I don't know, 20, I don't know what we had. We had, we had about three different uh, cells come in. But, uh, I kept begging these guys to see if anyone was lost. And they kept telling me they was all saved. I said, this is disgusting. Now we just got to have fun. And so we preached the book, and we had a good time. And these guys were encouraged. And me and Rodrigo went to prison uh, yesterday. Thank God we were let out. And uh, we had one saved. But a few others prayed, so we don't really know. But one did raise his hand during him. But there was a good spirit. The guys were encouraged. Why? The Word of God. The Word of God does something. And when you believe that, it always works. In John chapter 7, look at verse 43. And you teenagers, if you ever uh, listen to preach or your pastor preach, and you cannot understand what I'm saying, would you make a little note? I will not bite your head off. You make a little note. You ain't even got to sign it. You just say, preacher, it's a little bit, I couldn't really, your message was sort of college level or something, you know. I'm not trying to demote you. I'm just saying, if you can't get the message, I need to know. I think it was Moody that says he brought the cooks down, the cookies down to where everybody could eat them. Now, some people will praise themselves for bringing their church up to an educated level to where everybody's Ph.D. level, and that's their business. But I just want to make sure everybody's getting it. Right? I want to make sure teenagers get the message, adults get the message. I want to make sure I get the message. So, you, 
be sure to let me know about that. And if it's delivered right, it'll be received right. Verse 33 of chapter 7. It says, so there was a division among the people because of him. You see that? <laughs> because of him. What was there? A division among the people. Everybody got that? John chapter 7, look at 44. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Right? A little bit of fear of God in him, huh? But look at verse 40, 45. Then came the officers to the chief priests, the Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? And 46 is what I want you to see. The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. The authority of his words. So we know from old time, according to uh, you know uh, Isaiah there, we know from looking at creation what his word does, we know in these last days, the Word of God says that we learn from Jesus and what He said while He was here, right? And we know there are always divisions about who He is and what He has spoken. But when you get the, uh, the, the, the when you get the part of who He is right, what He has spoken becomes the absolute truth. Once you understand who He is, there's no question about what He's saying. Now please turn in your Bibles to Acts 27. We're going to have Paul, uh, Paul has a voyage here. And you're going to see God's leadership, God's protection, God's provision, and God's purpose. Now, those are some good P's, but they're not going to be like 1, 2, 3, or 5, 6. I'm just telling you what it's going to see. Just there was P's in there, okay? Now, Christian, you need to understand your journey is not an accident. Christian, God knows what you're going to encounter on that journey. And Christian, God uses his spoken word. Christian, God uses his people at times, even the devil. To correct your path. Christian, don't be a blockhead. Don't be a blockhead. What's that? Someone with ears but refuses to listen. Refuses to listen. Let's go to the introduction. That'll be uh, chapter 27, or the first uh, eight verses here. And when it was, de when it was determined that we should uh, sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners. Unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus, of the Augustus band, and entering into a ship of Ad, uh, Adramatium, uh, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Ar, uh, Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. Well, that's a good guy watching as a prisoner. And when uh, we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against uh, Sinidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Solomon, and hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens. There are a lot of messages there. Matter of fact, there's a song written about Haven and Rest. Nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now, when much time was spent, and when the sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Notice verse 10. Verse 9 and 10. God speaks his word through a man. Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lady and ship, but also of our lives. Now that's what Paul told them, right? 
man of God told him that. Now look at verse 11. This is somebody that doesn't listen. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Then we have some consequences for verse 20, or verse 12 rather than 20. And because the haven was not commodious to wintering, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to uh, Venice and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete and lieth toward the south uh, west and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, losing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a, tem a tempestuous wind called Eurocola. Eurocola did. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Claude, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was what? Was what? Taken. Was then taken away. So you have a man of God telling somebody that he heard from God that they shouldn't do this. And you have a group of other people that didn't listen to him. And the result of not listening to him caused a whole lot of problems here, as you can see. And um, the expositorily, uh, going into this chapter would be fantastic to go to all the geographical locations, uh, look at the people, understand what a haven is, how it's away from everything in a little coastal area, and uh, you would, uh, you would uh, get the sense that that's where they're supposed to have peace and tranquility and all this kind of good stuff. And you see, though, you, none of them have this. And it's not because they don't know how to sail. They're sailors. And so the centurion, hearing what the man of God said, as opposed to a captain of a ship that's supposed to know what he's doing, chose what? The guy. It's common sense, right? <laughs> I'm not going to ask somebody that's a veterinarian to take out my hard work on it. That's a bad analogy. But anyway, think about that. So the centurion, he's a Roman soldier. They believe in, uh, uh, you know, the... Uh, multi-gods, and uh, Paul's God is just another God. He likes Paul, apparently, though. Paul's got a good disposition, or he wouldn't like him. We know that because when they stopped, they let him go talk to his friends, right? Y'all with me? Boy. Mm. And uh, so, you have this problem. Now, I've always heard this. Please don't tell people I told you so. I've been doing a little study in my Bible. I wish I could say God never told that. I wish I could say God's guys never said that. Now I'm trying to figure out who told me not to tell somebody I told you so. You ever get like that? Anyway, I know it's probably not nice. But let's look at verse 21. But after long <laughs> abstinence, what does that mean? Paul just keeping his mouth shut. That's what it means. Paul stood forth in the midst of them. He didn't go like this. No, he's in the midst of them. He had enough. Okay. And he stands in the midst of them. He says, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loose from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. What did he say? I told you so. Well, oh, that's going to make me cry. Tough. You don't want to try next time? Listen. Isn't it amazing how I don't know if the psych got into all of us or something or I mean there's we're a mess, man. We're trying to deal with people we're afraid to tell them the truth. And afterwards we're we're, we're afraid to point out. Did you see what happened? Because we don't want to break your little hearts. I won't say I talked to I talked to somebody last night about school teachers. School teachers, a lot of them 
can't even help those kids, those students, because of their stupid parents. You say, how does that work? When a parent tells a school teacher that if they're going to, uh, if they're going to critique their child, that they only want to hear positive things in a positive way, they never get a good picture. There's actually parents like that. When they have these conferences, they can't say, listen, your, your child, he can't keep his hands to himself. He's messing with everybody in the class. He won't listen to me. Oh, you got to somehow reword this flowerly so the kid looks good. And it's almost like preaching is supposed to be that way. Now, that's like when he talks about, well, Brother Bob, I don't know. Maybe I just look for loopholes because I'm just a mean, you know what? And I just got that in me and my crawl. And you pray for me. I know about compassion. I know what I have to do. And there ain't none of you in here. If you call me, I'm not going to be there. And I take care of my friends. And I do the best I can with what I got. And I can improve. There is no doubt about that. But as far as uh, helping somebody, you need to cut through a lot of the junk and get to the point so they can get some help. And what Paul's saying, he stood in the midst of him, and I could just see that guy. Paul ain't no wuss, and he's educated. And he counts all things with dumb. And he didn't come to them with excellency of speech. People never read their Bible. He wanted them to make sure that they all had the truth. And so when they didn't listen to God, he simply told them so. That's what he did. And verse 22 to 20 or, or 22 and 24. Here's the proof. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. That's neat. What is that? Paul's qualifying. Qualifying to them where he got his information. So there's no doubt about it. And then verse 25 is the key to success, Christian. It really is. Verse 25 says this, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. Look what it says. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. That's the key. Believe God. How? Exactly as he said. Go to Psalms uh, 12, 6 and 7. You quote it. You ought to almost know it by heart. These two verses are famous verses. Psalms 12, 6 and 7. We'll, we'll read some verses. No, she's not to us. You ready? Words of the Lord are what? Pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them who? O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation for how long? That's what it says. That's what it means. Go over to Romans 4.20. Romans chapter 4 verse 20. What's the name of the message? When God speaks, listen. Listen. Chapter 4 and verse 20. The Bible says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to who? God. 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 Who's to talk about? Abraham. Staggered not. Didn't look at the verse that you could plainly understand and say, Whoa, this can't happen. This won't, this won't work. Wasn't one of them things. He looked at it and said, what he said. Right? It's a simplistic message today, but listen to me, it's hard. It's hard to take God at his word sometimes. It's just, it's just hard. And then also, uh, 1 Thessalonians, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Don't you like hearing those kids next door? Don't you? I think it's, no, that's music to my ears. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's why when you come to hear him preach, and if you don't hear a lot of what I say, at least turn in your Bible to the verse and read it, please. 1 
verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard of who? Us, human instrumentality. Ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which what? Which effectually worketh also in you that what? It's not going to work if you don't believe. You come to preach and expect to hear from God. I come to preach expecting to give out some of God. I expect it. I expect God to work through me. Preparation, you teach Sunday school here. Whoever works around it does anything. They pray, they ask God to use them to deliver the message. And so it's not a flippant thing to sit and just receive words. It's an important thing. It's structure. It's supernatural. I mean, it's security. Don't take it for granted. The absence of it, you'll find out real soon. In 1 John, go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. It's in your Bible. That's first Revelations. 1 John chapter 1.
Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. In other words, that storm was coming on, threw anchors in there and hoping that they could just last through the night uh, with this storm. Forgotten already what Paul had told them. And, uh, and as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the fore ship, and uh, under color means uh, the situation and everything, someone's probably going to try to escape, slip off. You want to die on the ship, you take the chance of trying to go to shore, right? Anyway, verse 31, verse 31, Paul speaks to the same centurion that, remember, before, didn't listen to him, went to the master, right? Paul said to the centurion, to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. That's what he said. Now immediately, look at verse 32. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. What? They became believers. Right? Look at verse 33. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. That's commendable. They listened to him there, that they fasted. And now the fourteenth day, and that's a significant number in the Bible too when you go through. But anyway, verse 34. Wherefore I pray you take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave what? Thanks to God. Now look at this, please. In the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. He gave thanks to God, not under cover, but in the presence of them all. You go to the restaurant, you give thanks for your food. And when you feel embarrassed, you tell your embarrassment of your flesh, good, I'm glad you are, because I'm doing it anyway. And you just do it. Good for you. Gives God the glory. And then, 36 and 37, how about this? They're going to be of good cheer. Now they have to be fed. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And we were in all... We were in all in the ship, 203 score and 16 souls. Just letting you know how many is in the ship. And then 38 41. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat to the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land. But they discovered a certain creek with a shore into the which they were minded, if it were possible to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves onto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and uh, hosed up the mainsail into the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground. And the fore part stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save who? Paul. Kept them from their purpose and commanded, commanded that they which swam should cast themselves first to the sea and get to land. And then look what happens. Imagine this. Imagine what happens in verse 44. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. Why? Because they could swim. And so it came to pass that they escaped. Now look what it says. All safe to land. What are you saying, preacher? Well, when you listen to God, duh. I mean, government decisions have to be made. No matter what society in, they got somebody running the show. But keep in mind the same centurion came through for Paul. He believed Paul had something going for him. And he was not going against Paul's God. 
something took place in that centurion's life, and what took place was he saw the evidence and not believe in what Paul told him to do. And you'll, though, though Noah, for all those years, preached judgment, I think 150 or 120, I can't, I forgot. A whole lot, a lot, long time. People heard him over and over again, over and over again. I mean, you're talking about long suffering of God, 100 something years. He preached judgment and the righteousness of God. And yet only eight were saved. But he did what he was supposed to do. guarantee everybody getting saved and everybody's life going hunky-dory. But I guarantee you this, that if you do what God says, God will take care of you through whatever you go through. Because you're obeying Him. Not obeying anyone else that's contrary to Him. All safe. So you do it God's way, that means don't rebel. Don't be so full of your interest that you cannot see God's. When God speaks, listen. I mean, you cannot trust God too much. Right. Nor trust yourself too little. Faith. Faith is a principle which hath its root deeper than feelings. We believe whether we see or not. We believe whether we feel or not. Faith. Faith obliterates time annihilates distance, and brings future things at once into its possession. He would have us like children who believe what their father tells them. What he's saying, preacher? When God speaks, listen. If you come to church wanting to listen, you'll hear. If you come to church just because you've got to come to church, you're not hearing nothing. For eventually the Holy Spirit does something to you, maybe taps you on the shoulder, Consider yourself today. Consider how far God has brought you from your salvation. Do you remember your salvation at least? Something about it? Do you remember how God's provided for you? When did he stop? When do you think he stopped? When have you taken God at his word? About anything. You read his word, right? Look for it. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. There's things like that in there. Right? You, you show your kids that, believe it. Because one day they're going to get older, what are you going to do then? You can't have them under your roof, you can't have them in your sight, parents. you got to believe and trust your prayers. you got to believe God's going to hear you. We know everybody's got their own will, but you're just supposed to do what you're supposed to do. You do what you're supposed to do. You deliver the goods. God will bless them. God will bless you. So when he speaks, you listen. There's just one, one story in the Word of God. There's several. You can go to Jonah. You can go to all sorts of stories in this book. It's the same story over and over again from Genesis all the way through. God says something. If you don't believe it and act on it, because if you believe it, you're going to act on it, right? Then there's consequences. So deal with that and understand that. Don't make excuses. Just tell God you're sorry. Move on with your life. But listen to what he says and believe it. And he'll bless you. Don't play games with God. Please don't play games with God. Let's all stand.